Uh, all right, welcome uh, everyone to our uh, uh, bi-weekly uh, Healthcare AI Forum. This is put on by the Center for Collaborative AI and Healthcare, which is part of the Institute for uh, AI and Medicine. Uh, so we're really uh, excited today to have our, our next speaker. Uh, it's uh, uh, Tanu, and it's like a prince. It's going to go by one name today. Um, so uh, Tanu uh, comes to us. She's a third-year uh, PhD student in the Driscoll Graduate Program. Uh, your PhD advisor, I just want to make sure. Gabriel Rockland is uh, her PhD advisor, and uh, she'll be talking to us today about um, some of her work. So I'll just leave it to you. All right. Hi, everyone. So my name is Tanu. Uh, I'll be talking about the, a recent paper from Baker Lab that is um, trying to design uh, binders for helicopeptides. So um, just a little bit of an you see a little bit of a patch there, but never mind. Um, so helical peptides, um, the, the basic need is that a lot of these peptides, um, like parathyroid hormone, peptide, neuropeptides, these are all biomarkers that are that currently rely on um, quantification through antibodies um, to uh, in blood samples, et cetera. And these are used for diagnosing several diseases. But one of the problems is that when we try a, if we try to bind these biomarkers using antibodies, antibodies are usually much more unstable, really expensive to produce, and are not the they don't bind to these um, helical peptides in the best way. Um, because uh, and they usually the way they the, these antibodies bind to the helical peptide is in its non-helix format. And um, so the, the aim of this paper is to really um, design better binders for these biomarkers so the, they can have uh, higher affinity biomarkers that can better quantify um, these helical peptides. Um, one of the problems or why it hasn't been done thus far is because these peptides usually exist in a non-helical format, which are unstructured. And when in isolation, they kind of just like self-associate and aggregate together, making it inaccessible for like antibodies to bind to them. And um, they are also the, to be able to take this helical peptide and um, uh, make a binder that binds to it in a helical, in the peptide being in a helical format, that is energetically unfavorable for the peptide itself. So there's a lot of like um, energy that needs to be involved uh, or energy diffusions that need to be involved in being able to like bind to them in a, a less energetically fav favorable format. Um, so the way that this paper tries to do that is um, so parametric design initially, so Rosetta is a protein design uh, software that's been used for a couple of years now, and it has done a pretty decent job designing binders and such, but more recently, since um, the, the kind of like a upscale in machine, uh, machine learning and deep learning formats, um, the Baker Lab tried to delve its um, delve into more of deep learning formats to design proteins. And so they actually developed, sorry, I'm trying to point um, the RF joint, which um, the way it works is essentially it's a information recovery type of deep learning model, which uh, trains itself on protein and PNN, which is a sequence form, uh, sequence deep learning model, also developed by Baker Lab, and AlphaFold, which was developed by Google DeepMind. And so it uh, RF, the way RF joint works, it, it, it goes in this like loop format of uh, creating a information recovery Pro, uh, protein backbone using information recovery using protein MPNN and alpha fold to kind of predict, uh, get sequences and predict its structure, and then go in a loop to kind of like create better and better um, binders or uh, overall better, more stable and recognizable proteins in, in kind of like a loop model. And that's, that was one of the, I guess, forefronts of, uh, deep learning based models that was able to design proteins until RF diffusion came out, um, which is more of a design, um, it's a diff 
diffusion-based uh, probabilistic modeling design, which what it does, it, it noises, and I'll show you later, one moment. So basically this is the, pro the current like protein design model uh, and pipeline that they use to design the protein. And then they, the protein MPNN, as I mentioned before, is for sequence redesign. And then they use AlphaFold for, to predict the structure after they've designed both the protein backbone and the protein, um, protein sequence. And they predict the structure and how stable it is and what the secondary structure looks like using AlphaFold. And finally, they use filters such as contact molecular surface, interface PAE, which predicts the um, confidence of a single amino acid in relation to an amino acid that's next to it and in relation to amino acids all around it. And so it tells you kind of like it's a confidence-based metric and shape complementarity, which relates to how well your the shape of your binder is to the peptide that you're trying to bind it to in this context. Um, so yeah, just to go a little bit more into RF joint. So initially what they do is everything uh, to start off any protein design. Um, this paper kind of starts off with just trying to sample different types of helices that already exist in the protein data bank in nature and trying to like sample them and kind of assess how the shape complementarity of our peptides look in comparison to this helix. So they try to do like assess helices with the distance from the peptide and how much coiling they can be around this peptide that they're trying to design binders against. And then for the RF joint part comes in where you basically do a uh, motif scaffolding around the RF unit. So say you find a, a scaffold that you think is like, is able to house this peptide really well. Then what you do is you keep the sequences that um, you think are important for the, and is able to interact with the peptide. And you use RF joint, as I said, in an information recovery based model to kind of design the, the backbones that could easily, and backbones and then eventually sequences that would house the, the peptide even more, um, I guess, in a, cradle the peptide even, even better. And so this is kind of the way the RF joint works. Um, it is again, like it is, learning in a in a in a loop based model but at the end it is only providing you the backbone so you still have to use protein mpnn and alpha fold to then generate the sequences and um alpha fold to predict the final structure so they used rf joint and they by taking a scaffold using parametric design and when they basically did a um, they uh, designed more scaffolds using RF joint. They saw that, first of all, that when you have, if you just use a scaffold and you do protein MPNN on it, which is just fill it with sequences, you um, see a lower affinity of this, uh, of just a protein MPNN model. But when you, when you take a scaffold, you run it through in paint RF joint, and you then pr use protein MPNN to fill it with sequences, you like increase the affinity of the scaffold. So this is just an assay, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's, it's called Florence, fluorescence pl polarization, where um, polarization, uh, like fluor Polarized light is used to assess the binding of uh, a peptide or any of the, a binding to any object to its d different types of proteins. And so you basically increase the concentration in a specific way. And it, at the end, this curve kind of tells you the um, binding affinity or KD. So here's another um, scaffold that they, I guess the best candidate they got from RF joint, which was to the PTH. Um, Th uh, the parathyroid hormone. Um, and you can kind of see that the, the already with using RF joint, they were able to bind to the PTH at a 6.04 nanomolar um, affinity. Versus, and the, sorry, the other thing to notice here is that uh, PTHRP is a different type of uh, peptide, which has a close sequence and structure similarity to PTH. But because, because this uh, protein design pipeline is able to design proteins in such a specific way that um, it binds to specific uh, peptides uh, 
instead of like doing off target binding to peptides which look similar so basically it has very little binding to pthrp except uh, and uh, the binding to the pth is actually pretty tight um then they move on to partial diffusion that which is a uh, a module that can be used in RF diffusion. So just to explain how partial diffusion works, uh, in a diffusion-based model, you start off with a model and you noise and denoise the structure. And in in by learning from various, tra uh, various training sets, the machine learning platform is able to design diverse structures um, after the denoise process. Um, but what happens in a partial diffusion process is you start off um, not from a, a Gaussian modeled uh, noise based system, but um, more of a known structure. So I've, in this case, they ha already have a scaffold that we know that binds really well to a nanomolar affinity. So they start off with that stru structure. They noise partially, so a, t a time step in the, in the RF diffusion process, you can go up to a time step of 200, just a parameter um, that you can increase to, but they try to noise to time step of 10, 40, 80, and so on and so forth. And then basically denoise back to kind of see what types of different structures you can get. And um, the, the way this works is the, obviously pretty intuitively, the less you, the less you noise, the more similar your um, end structure looks to your original structure. So um, although this paper doesn't mention um, the types of binder, like what time steps actually gave them really good affinity binders. Um, but here you can see, this is um, SCT and GCG based binders um, from InPaint and they were at a specific uh, nanomolar affinity. But when they used partial RF diffusion, so they took scaffolds from an RF InPainting um, design process and they moved it over and did partial diffusion on it, they were able to increase the affinity of these binders. Um, for GCG, it went up to like picomolar affinity, which is actually pretty great um, for binders. Um, one cool thing that I liked in this paper was they kind of talked about the GCG binder. So in gray is what they had in the RF joint output and in the blue, is uh, our protein from RF diffusion or partial RF diffusion. And you can kind of see that the phenylalanine from the gray is uh, diffused to isoleucine. So that allowed it, um, the, the structure to have better packing um, overall uh, and better interaction with the, the peptide, which is in yellow. The same thing, another substitution was a tyrosine was replaced with a serine here. And um, that allowed it to the the serine to form hydrophobic interaction or hydrogen bond with the peptide backbone. So that these are some of the slight changes that happens during a partial diffusion that allows like increase in affinity while keeping most of the structure very similar to um, its original backbone. Finally, RF diffusion. Um, so what they did was like, okay, if partial diffusion works this well, what happens if we don't provide the, the model anything except a, a single peptide? And so, and then completely uh, noise and denoise the structure. So again, the, as I said, explained before, RF diffusion works in a way where it takes um, Gaussian noise and denoise, uh, noises and denoises the structure to find, bi find binders to this peptide peptide. And uh, as so basically, you can see like if they when they didn't provide the model any initial structure, except for the just the peptide, it's also able to find um, binders, which are of pic picomolar quantity. So that's pretty great. And again, um, as specific to PTH, and um, not able to bind so well to PTH RP. Um, this is another binder to the BIM, um, also in PPCOMOR quantities. So I think some of the uh, the takeaway from this was um, that uh, they can take, you can basically, a partial diffusion can be used to sample binders that already have good affinities and increase the affinity of these small backbones and make adjustments. And then 
Although, and then RF diffusion is al also able to create these same types of shapes without providing it an initial structure. Um, lastly, uh, the fact that they were able to find bind uh, find like such uh, tight binders to both BIM and PTH without any starting structure and such high affinities is the first time they were able to do this using computational design without any experimental op optimization, which is a pretty great thing. Usually it may, like needs several rounds of optimization before you can uh, find proteins that are actually pretty uh, tight binders and several rounds of experimental techniques. So the fact that they could do it in one straight pipeline is pretty extraordinary. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so I, I know nothing about proteins besides what I learned in school years ago. So a little bit of background. So this is designed to predict um, protein structure by giving it the amino acid uh, input. And then, go ahead. Yeah, so I think so it, that's why I, I try to show the pipeline because it does get a little confusing. So um, RF joint and RF diffusion is designed to give you back protein backbones without any sequences. Protein MPNN is designed to then fill that backbone with sequences that it's trained in an evolutionary based model. So it kind of looks at the backbone and gives you protein sequences. And then alpha fold is used to um, predict the structure and what it would look like. So the highest complexity, I'm assuming, comes in alpha fold, right? Because yes. all the possibility space is huge. Right. Yeah. That's very impressive. There's a question. Um, Tim, can you go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks. I, I really appreciate you guys. Um, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, sorry. I really appreciate you guys uh, uh, tucking into these um more uh, basic science on the biochemistry and cell biology papers. So just hats off for for digging into it. Um, uh, I'm 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 sure uh, a small group of us really appreciate it. But anyway, uh, so uh, David Baker's lab has really been a pioneer in in the sort of uh, folding design from before AlphaFold and stuff like that. And one of the things that that they were tackling, uh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago was actually trying to design proteins that both had onloading and offloading things like trying to make a sort of synthetic hemoglobin kind of thing, which ends up really being challenging when you want to have essentially a, um, a sensor that can also do work. And I, I, I wonder if, if uh, this new tool would be anything other than just figuring out how to get a peptide that folds correctly, or whether you think it has, you know, bigger applications for these really far reaching kind of uh, protein design um, questions. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, yeah, if you read some of the papers that come out of David's lab, they really delve into like much more higher, like molecular based, like things that bind for a specific amount of time, fall off, like lock and key chain, key me mechanisms. Um, and I think if you, uh, if you look at the original RF diffusion papers, they also do all sorts of things like looking, not just like looking at peptides for binders, but also trying to bind to, um, I think different types of metals. So it becomes a more complex like enzyme design problem. Um, so I, I, I really do think that this, uh, this kind of tool, in addition to other, like other biochemistry tools, maybe would lead to, yeah, it is, it's, it's just a very promising pipeline. And in addition to think like other things that we have learned, we can play around with the optimization of these to, um, delve into like really specific and complex protein engineering problems. Hey, Tanu, thank you for this. I, I had a question. So like, um, I presume a lot of this is really more in the, for like hypothesis generating, like it's, it sort of generates potential like structures, then it has to be then sort of like tested within a laboratory setting, presumably. Yeah. With the, with the output of this process, is there a, 
like a public facing way of getting these hypotheses out there so that many because I, I imagine like the the funnel point is going to be you can model these things and generate a whole bunch of hypotheses but then that that next step is going to be pretty challenging or 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 do we have to wait for publications for these things to come out because it, it, it seems like if you could really make this available in a library format then then there, people could just go off and and it might align with their lab's interests or you know their ability to test it in some particular environment yeah. So are you t talking more testing based? Like how do we test a lot of these or how do we uh, make the source, I guess, like the uh, source code available to yeah, the design? But, or the output of this, for example. So okay. how do you how do you make it so the output of this is something that other people can say, oh, based on this process that we've published about, yeah. this is the uh, this is a structure that's likely to have a very high binding affinity for this. Mm -hmm. And then people can go forth from there and say, oh, look at this. I, why would I regenerate this i'm going to go and, and try this out this? first yeah. yeah i mean i think this i guess like maybe uh, yeah i don't know i think the structures and all the information about like how they bind and things are available i to my knowledge which is limited <laughs> um i don't know if there's like a crowdsourced way in which like everything that's ever available and designed and he heavily optimized is is available in, in a single platform, but my knowledge is limited. Maybe there is something out there. Well, that, yeah. That's the challenge of, you know, the promise of AI yeah. is get everyone's eyeballs on it, but then there's curation, right? And property rights and research rights. And this is what I think we're gonna struggle with more than the functionality of the, the people generating the code. They're, they're gonna go to the moon. Right. It's gonna be these other implications, just like you mentioned, that will be the real challenge. How do we tackle? Should we be talking about these things today? I, I mean, we need to test the thing that uh, we may uncover the issues <laughs> today, uh, but I think no one's going to have the solution. If they had a solution, they'd be off making some gigantic company. But like, uh, but but I do think that uh, you know, recognizing these as problems down the road, hopefully you can start building in. For example, uh, I know that in other domains that we've been in, uh, like phenotype definitions, we early days created like a library function, right? And so a publicly available place where everyone could store their definitions, their pseudocode, et cetera, and, and the validation studies that were done around them. So all that was put in a public place oh. so that anybody could access this. And then nobody would start from scratch. And the end result is that things that worked great, great. Things yeah. that didn't work great, also useful because uh -huh. you wouldn't burn a lot of time. And so the end result, the net result was that with limited resources, which is basically people time or computational time, mm -hmm. you wouldn't run down blind alleys. You would end up saying, all right, well, let me focus my efforts on this, which is aligned with my interests. Yeah. So it's really more about how do you take, because uh, there's not you know, infinite resources out there. How, do you, how are you efficient about deploying them? So that, that's just something to think about as we, as we develop these new tools with these new models. How do you capture the results of those and make those widely available besides the, the laborious process of, 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 of uh, publication? Right. I think now that I think of it, I think there's like, well, the, Rosetta like has a whole, I mean, uh, like a website where like we have like the centralized, like all the people who are working on design stuff uh, are able to like publish, ask questions, like how do you use this specific tool? Um, and there's like a whole Slack channel as well as like forums that you can like discuss your design problems at. Apart from there, I think uh, there's an open fold consortium, which is between a collaboration between DeepMind, some of the Rosetta people, some folks from like Stanford, other like protein designers. And I think they're trying to make more of like a centralized uh, thing where you can, yeah, like have all your good designs, bad designs. Uh, yeah. Yuan, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I actually had a great presentation. I have a question in terms of the big picture of workflow of this pipeline here. It seems that the RF diffusion, partial diffusion is used to generate, generate some of the structures that are later be uh, predicted and validated with, with AlphaFold. Yeah. And it seems like a linear process is flowing in one direction, but one, would, one cannot keep wondering why they don't just uh, create a feedback loop as the structure being predicted by AlphaFold 2 and whether 
to test whether that predictive structure is somewhat similar, consistent to what the uh, partial diffusion is meant to generate. And then if you have this feedback loop, you can increase the accuracies of the generated, generated structures, right? So uh, did they talk about, I, I didn't seem to find that kind of a feedback loop that was used in the, uh, that was mentioned in the paper. So just wanted to uh, see if you have a, maybe have a digger deep into the, into the paper. Yeah, I think in, in that regard, I know that RF diffusion is initially was at least trained on Rosetta fold, which is a, uh, it's an alternative to alpha fold, which is also a structure prediction thing. And that's the reason like this DDPM model was able to be so accurate because it did initially train on structure predictions. I think, I mean, I, I'm not in Baker lab, but I think what they try to do is every so often um, have papers and like good designs and stuff that they have developed goes back into like retraining and optim I'm sure they're trying to optimize RF diffusion even more to try to increase the amount of things that an amount of like problem solve uh, problems that it can be used at so like improve its enzyme design process a little bit better because I know that it has some um, limitations depending on how small your um, in, initial like peptide or thing that you want to create a binder to is, but that's a problem they're aware of. And I think they try to do a feedback loop, maybe not as a consistent basis, but something that they like in the next version, they might optimize. I see. It's good to know that the at least to get some kind of manual feedback loop behind the scene that's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Great. Right. If there are no other questions, uh, Yuan, can you? Uh, yeah, can so I'm happy to uh, start introducing our next speaker, uh, Zhiqi Chen from Ohio State University. She's a fifth year computer science and engineering PhD student and advised by Dr. Xia Ning. And her research focuses on generative AI for science. And she has developed innovative generative models for several key problems in the design of small molecule drugs. And in today's uh, presentation, she will be talking about their work in Recom last year on T cell receptor optimization with reinforcement learning and mutation policies for precision immunotherapy. Uh, Zhiqi, uh, I'll now turn the stage to you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Zhiqi. Um, and today I'm going to introduce one of my previous work about optimizing T-cell receptor using reinforcement learning. And first, I'd like to introduce the background of t about T-cell receptor. So T-cell receptor is a molecule on the surface of T-cell in the immune system. And T-cell receptor can recognize peptide antigens and presented by the MHC class. MHC molecule and then trigger the immune response. And in, in T-cell receptor, typically we have a beta chain and alpha chain. And each beta chain and alpha chain has three loops, CDR, CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. Particularly, CDR3 region is the most variable region and directly involved in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in recognizing peptides presented by the MHC molecule. And previous study actually also indicate that the CDR3 of beta chain actually contributes most to the peptide recognition with, compared with other regions. Therefore, in our, in our work, we focus on the beta chain of C CDR, CDR3 region. And for brevity, in the following slide, we find name TCR, actually, I mean, it's CDR3 region of beta chain. And by modifying the T cell receptor, our work might have the potential to contribute to the T cell receptor, T cell therapy, which directly modifies the T cell receptor of T cell to increase the binding affinity with peptide antigens. Modifying T cell receptor is a challenging problem. The first challenge is that for each given peptide, there might be only a limited number of T cell receptors with high affinities. Therefore, it can be difficult to directly identify them. In addition, as TCR, T cell receptor always follow specific patterns. And if we randomly mutate them, this could lead to invalid non TCRs that do not follow the pattern of real TCRs. So, this brings to our goal 
which is for any given peptide, we want to mutate any existing TCRs into ones that are not only that all, not only can recognize the peptide, but also follow the patterns of real TCRs. Next, I'd like to introduce our problem formulation. So we formulate our the TCR optimization problem as a Markov decision process, which includes four components. The first is the state. The state is a type of a potential TCR sequence and a peptide P. And the sub, subscript T represents, represents the 10 step and S sub sub T means the state at 10 sub T. An action is the type of mutation site and a mutant amino acid. With the action, we can transform a TCR sequence into a new sequence by replacing one no, amino acid in the mutation site with the mutant amino acid. And this new sequence and peptide together form the state at next step. And this transition between, as, um, between states is deterministic. And at the initial step, at the initial, initial step, we randomly sample a peptide or target peptide and an existing TCR from our data set. And we can, and through a sequence of actions, we can transform the initial state into the terminal state. And we define a state as terminal state if not step T reaches the maximum step limit. And on a, on a optimized TCR, it's quantified. It's predicted to be valid and bind, and bind with target peptide. So with the target peptide P, we use a reward function to, to evaluate the validity and binding probability of TCR sequences. And our objective is to learn a policy network that can produce such a sequence of actions that can transform any existing TCRs into new TCRs that not only valid, but also bind with target peptide. So that's all about no problem formulation. So the next step is to represent the state using vectors for the prediction of new networks. So in our framework for each amino acid in peptide or TCR sequence, we use a combination of three types of encoding methods, including the blossom, enco blossom encoding based on blossom matrix, one hot encoding, and the learnable embedding purely learned by new networks. And by using these um, encoding methods, we can represent each amino acid as a vector and transform each peptide or TCR sequence as a sequence of vectors. And we then use two bidirectional LSTM to learn the embedding for each amino acid in a TCR and learn the embedding for the entire peptide. With the state representation available, we can predict which action should be, predict should be selected. We first predict the, which position in a TCR sequence should be mutated, specifically, for each position i, for each position in the TCR sequence, we use the embedding of the amino acid at that position and, the, and use the peptide embedding together as the input to predict the probability for position i to, to be mutated. And we, we, with the probability distribution across all the positions in the TCR sequence, we can sample a position that needs to be mutated. And in this example, we sample the fourth position. And then based on the, based on the embedding of this, uh, of, of this amino acid at this position, we can predict the type of, we can predict the type of new amino acid. And we can sample the new amino acid type based on the distribution of this new amino acid type. And we, re we can repeat this process until we reach the maximum number of steps or not optimized PCR satisfy our requirements that is valid and or bind with um, peptide. So now we, we are clear about the state representation and action prediction. Next, I will introduce our reward function. So um, the first I will introduce how to measure the validity of TCR sequence and its binding probability. To evaluate the validity of TCR, we first pre-train an autoencoder on real TCRs. This model is named as TCR AE. And we then propose two scores based on TCR AE. One is the reconstruction-based score. And the reconstruction-based score is based on the intuition that since TCR AE is only trained on real TCRs, so its encoding and its encoding and decoding process should follow the rules of true TCR sequences. So if we fit a non-TCR invalid TCR into TCR AE with unusual rules it has never seen in the training data set, our TCR AE should fail to reproduce this invalid one. 
So in this school, we calculate the distance, the added distance between the between the, the sequence and its reproduced sequence from TCRAE. And we normalize this added distance with the length of its uh, with the length of input sequence. And we expect that not, for non-TCR, since it will have very large at a distance, it will receive a very low reconstruction-based score. However, it might be possible that if our TCR-AE learns very generic patterns that can be shared by both non-TCR non and TCRs, using reconstruction-based score could fail to detect non-TCRs in that case. So to further enhance the quality of validity score, we further introduce a density estimation-based score. We evaluate the density of TCRs on the latent space learned by TCRAE using a Gaussian mixture model. And our assumption is that non-TCR should be different from valid TCR and therefore should be far from the dense region of real TCRs. And we use the sum of this reconstruction school and density-based school together as a TCR validity school. So now we are clear about the measurement of TCR validity analysis about how we can evaluate the binding probability of TCR sequence. Actually, we use a model named ergo to predict the binding probability between TCR and the given peptides. The reference of ergo is listed here. So since we assume that a TCR um, and we combine the TCR validity with the, with the binding score predicted by ergo, and uh, using this function. And since we assume that a TCR can be viewed as valid and of viewed as valid if, if it is validity score, if it is a threshold delta C, we do not want to generate a TCR, TCR sequence that has even much higher TCR score than even the real TCRs, right? So I introduced a threshold. And if our validity score exceeds that threshold, the value of this part will be zero. Otherwise, there will be a negative value that penalizes the reward function. Uh, so Zixi, uh, if you could go back to the previous slide, I just want to make a clarification of your notation here. So this SR and SV, are they corresponding to the reward and value for that particular state? Yeah, yeah. OK. And, uh, and the RR and RD, uh, what are these that, 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 that are in your first slide? Um, uh, RD used to calculate the TCR validity score. The SV is the sum of R and RD. You can see this equation. Is it clear? And the D, what does D correspond to? The D corresponds to the density based score. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So this entire framework is based on a popular reinforcement learning algorithm named proximal policy optimization. I will not go into the details of this algorithm. Basically, we just start from uh, random initialized policy and apply this policy network to mutate the DCR sequences and collect its corresponding rewards. And based on the rewards, we can, uh, we can optimize the policy networks through PPO such that it will learn actions that need to um, TCR sequence in a terminal state with high rewards. And and in the end, we will learn a policy network that can produce a sequence of actions that needs to know TCR with, um, that needs to know quantify TCRs. So in addition, we further introduce a novel buffering and re-optimization mechanism into the TCR PPO. This mechanism will memorize TCRs that, that are difficult to be optimized and their corresponding peptides. And during the sampling, during the training, we will resample the TCRs from this uh, from this buffer and enable the old TCR model to re-optimize re these difficult cases. And this will enable our model to learn some learn more difficult patterns from these difficult difficult cases. And this TCR PPO with buffer is referred to as TCR PPO plus B. So that's all about our model. Now I'd like to introduce the experimental settings. So we use TCR sequence from TCRDB. And in the TCRDB, we have about seven million unique TCR sequences in total. We randomly sample 50,000 K sequences for the testing of TCRAE. And from this 50,000 K, 50 K TCR sequence, we further sample 1,000 TCRs for the testing of TCR PPO. For the rest of TCRs, we just use them to train TCRAE and TCR PPO. 
and for the target peptides, we select 10 peptides from MCPES and 15 peptides from VDJDB. And these peptides are selected due to that ergo model achieved above 90.9% 0.9 AUC values over the restrictive test set. So it might be reliable to use them as the reward function to evaluate the binding ability between peptide and jury TCR sequence. And we train two separate TPO model for peptides in MCPS and VDJDB. Since um, to our knowledge, we are the first one working on this specific problem. We don't have any existing baselines. So we have to build baselines by ourselves. We, we use two types of baselines. One is based on, one is to generate TCR sequences by adding amino acid one by one. Um, and here we use a tree search algorithm and a variation autoencoder with deprivation over the latent space as baselines. And another type of method is a mutation-based method, we, which mutate existing TCRs into new ones. We propose three mutation methods. One is based on random mutation strategy, and one is, one is based on greedy mutation, and one is, about, one is based on genetic algorithm. To compile our method with baseline methods, we use TCRPPO and the baseline methods to optimize each TCR sequence out of the 1,000 test sequence for each test peptide. And we define the TCR sequence to be quantified if it, is, it has high enough binding, binding score and high enough TCR validity score. We carefully select the threshold for these two scores. And we use this metric to evaluate the performance. We first calculate the percentage of quantified TCRs among all the output TCRs. We also calculate the average distance between the input TCR and the quantified TCR. And we also calculate the, the TCR vanity score and binding score over the vanity, valid TCRs and the quantified TCRs. And also the percentage of valid TCRs among on output TCRs. And finally, the number of calls to the reward function. And in this table, the RS represents the random select of uh, TCR sequence from TCRDB. So no, no no value on the percentage of quantified TCR means that it's very difficult to randomly identify a positive binding TCR sequence. So this means no, this problem is challenging. And by comparing all methods with the baseline methods, we can also observe that TCRPPO and TCRPPO plus B achieve the highest performance on the percentage of quantified TCR. And in meanwhile, we can also we also observe that our method actually identify quantified TCRs through less mutation step compared with you now baseline methods greedy mutation and identity mutation. And we further validate the effectiveness of our TCR validity score in distinguishing the TCRs from non-TCRs. Here by non-TCRs, I mean random sequences with first three amino acids based and not three amino acids based. And, ran and internal amino acids as random amino acids. And we combine our method with the likelihood ratio based score, which is one of the state of the art methods for auto domain detection. And in these two figures, the x axis shows the range of, val of validity score, and x axis shows the percentage of sequences correspond to specific value. And from this figure, we can conclude that our TCR validity can successfully distinguish. TCR sequence from random sequence, and uh, it also outperform the likelihood ratio based score. So that's all about my presentation. So before I start my QA, I'd like to further introduce myself. I have developed a drug model for, for key problems in the design of small molecules, including lead optimization and 3D ligand generation and retrosynthesis prediction. And actually, in addition to this work about about TCR optimization, I also developed a model for the, for the peptide generation using similar reinforcement learning algorithm. So since I will graduate by the end of this, this year, so I'm open to any opportunity for internship and for time opportunities. I will appreciate if you can consider me for these great opportunities. Yeah, thank you. I'm open to take any questions. That's great. Thank you, Zuchi. Yeah. Uh, questions from the audience?
Uh, I don't claim to understand the uh, biochemistry of this all, but what is the intuition behind including edit distance in your performance metrics? Because shouldn't it, like, as long as you have a valid TCR, does it, why does it matter? Um, because sometimes if we want to mutate the TCR sequence, mutate the TCR sequence extracted maybe from patient, we do not expect this TCR to be dramatically different from the original extracted TCRs. This is based on my knowledge. So I think added distance might be crucial. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have uh, one quick question regarding, so um, so TCRs, unlike BCRs, also require a uh, specific subtype of HLA. So I'm curious, have you given any consideration into the interaction between T-cell receptors and HLA and in that how a uh, productive TCR might be determined in this scenario? Yeah, this is a very good question. I, um, actually, I agree with you that MHC or HIA also plays a very important role in the in the recognition of PCR and recognition of peptide antigen. But for this work, we do not consider MHC molecule. But I, I agree with you that considering MHC might be very should be very important. In this might be our future work. We don't have any more questions in the audience, Yuan. Okay, actually, I have a question. Um, so you formalized the mutation process as a MDP. And so there is conditional independence assumption in that formulation. Um, my question is that, do you think that is a realistic assumption? And especially given the 3D confirmation of the CDR regions, as your mutations, you are assuming that they are conditional independence given whatever is first in the middle, but in 3D confirmations, they actually interact with each other for non-adjacent amino acids. So do you uh, think that this uh, Markov assumption is still realistic? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah. Um, this Markov decision, the Markov assumption might be um, I think for, for, for many reinforcement learning algorithm, actually the state between them in, in the state between no, no states in the sequential process might not be absolutely depend, independent from each other, right? So I think it might be okay to use a mark to formulate its problem as a Markov decision process. Okay. And so so here's another suggestion. Uh, so in the 3D confirmations, there, there are previous studies also demonstrating that although they in theory may interact with any other amino acids, but in reality, they seem to form clusters that are closely re interacting with each other. So although individual mutations on amino acid may not be conditional independent, but if you identify those clusters and the clusters themselves could be independent with each other and more fitting into the Markov assumption. And so you could sort of apply this MDP on sort of a larger level instead of just a single amino acid, but a cluster of the amino acids. So that's something to uh, consider and maybe a future work. Yeah, this sounds very interesting. Yeah, thank you for the okay. suggestion. Yeah. Uh, any uh, other questions from the uh, remote attendees? I don't see any other questions, Yuan. Uh, Ziki, thank you. Tanu, thank you for presenting today. Yeah, thank you.